years back when Ajahn Suat was invited to lead a retreat. And I was his interpreter. The last night of the retreat there was a question and answer session, and there was the inevitable question, how to carry the practice into your daily life. And the person asking the question was interpreting the practice as the particular technique of meditation that was being taught on the retreat. And yet John Swat fo focused most of his answer on practicing the precepts, developing virtue. And I thought I saw a number of people rolling their eyes, thinking, here we are meditators already, and he's teaching us this kindergarten stuff. But it wasn't kindergarten stuff. That's how the practice is lived in daily life. It's through virtue. Because remember the word for meditation in Pali, bhavana, doesn't mean sitting with your eyes closed. It means developing. You're developing good qualities in the mind. And the practice of virtue, right speech, right action, right livelihood, follows on right resolve, as does right mindfulness, right concentration. Right resolve covers the resolve to resolve for renunciation, resolve for no ill will, resolve for non-harming. And the precepts carry through this resolve in the area of your, your words and your speech, while the meditation carries it through and directly in the area of the mind. But it's hard to divine the mind from your words and excuse me, words and your actions. After all, who's given the orders when you do something? Who's given the orders when you say something? It's the mind. And when you're following the precepts, what are you doing? You're making a vow not to be harmful. You're making the vow to renounce any pleasures that may come from lying or stealing or killing. You're making the vow not to act on ill will towards anyone else, for yourself or for other people. And these vows are important. It's a promise you make to yourself. When the Buddha talks about observing the precepts, he means just that. You make this promise and you stick by it. You learn to trust yourself. And also you learn the, the sense of ease that comes when you don't do things that go against those principles. It may seem a little confining at first. You can't quite say everything you might want to say or do everything you might want to do. But that's the whole point. These desires to say or do those things, exactly where do they lead you? So practicing the precepts makes you more and more aware of the results of your actions, the consequences of what you do. It gives you a sense of your own power and of the responsibility that goes along with that power. And over time, as you figure out ways to lead your life, it follows with the precepts. You learn to trust yourself. This is really important. The other night I got a phone call from someone who wanted to practice meditation but kept saying over and over again, I, I don't trust myself, I don't trust myself. That kind of person is not ready to meditate. Because why don't you trust yourself? Well, you do things and yet you don't want to admit the consequences. So you start lying to yourself, hiding things from yourself, and then you can't trust yourself. 
Well, the precept is easy to be open with yourself. If you look at your behavior, there's nothing that you can criticize yourself about, nothing to feel ashamed of, nothing to deny. It creates an openness in the mind, an honesty inside the mind. And as the Buddha once said, that's the prerequisite for practicing the Dharma in any level, that you be honest. And so following the precepts creates the right environment for developing the mind further in meditation. It also develops some important skills, mindfulness and alertness persistence. You have to keep your precepts in mind. Remember that you've promised not to lie, not to speak divisively, not to speak harshly, not to engage in idle chatter. And you've got to be alert to watch your mouth to see, are you engaging in any of those kinds of speech? And it also involves discernment. Because there's some come sometimes where you don't want to tell the whole truth to somebody because it might be harmful. And at the same time, you don't want to lie. So what are you going to do? You have to figure out some way of getting around that whole truth. And yet still not say anything that's inaccurate. That requires ingenuity. So the practice of the precepts develops a lot of important skills. In addition to mindfulness and alertness, discernment, there's also simple persistence. Just stick with it. You make up your mind, I'm going to follow this precept no matter what. And that quality of persistence, determination. And these are all perfections. They're all also very essential qualities for meditation. When the Buddha describes right mindfulness, he says there's mindfulness, alertness, and what he calls ardency, which is another word for right effort or persistence. These are the qualities you have to bring to being focused on the body in and of itself, focused on feelings in and of themselves whatever the topic of your, your meditation. So that when you sit down to meditate, you're not coming totally green to the practice. You've already been developing these qualities in your daily life, in the way you speak, in the way you act. And then after you've been meditating, you continue the same process. You're taking that mindfulness and alertness that you've been developing in the meditation and you're putting them to use. You're like the person who goes down to the gym, not because he wants a beautiful body, but because he wants to be strong, so he can use his strength for good purposes. Same with meditation. We're meditating not simply to get a nice peaceful state of mind, but you take that peaceful state of mind and you put it to use in good ways, in the way you speak, in the way you act. These things are all reinforcing. Mutually reinforcing. So the next time you come to sit and meditate, you're in good shape to meditate. because you haven't been letting the mind wander off track. So you don't have to pull it back. You can think of the mind like a dog. If you keep it on a short leash, then when you want it to heal, okay, it's right there. If it's got it on a long leash, you can wander all over the place and get the leash wound around all kinds of things. And so when the time comes to bring it back to heel, you've got to unwind the leash. It takes a lot of time, many times. When you're sitting here meditating, the whole hour is spent unwinding the leash. It's 
so to get the mind to settle down quickly, you want it right nearby. This is how you keep it nearby, by keeping on top of your thoughts and your words and your deeds throughout the day. And when your thoughts, words, and deeds are within the precepts, and it's easy to get the mind to settle down, stay with the breath in the midst of what you're doing. Because the things that destroy your meditation, it's the things that destroy your focus in the course of the day, it's not just sights and sounds and smells and tastes and tactile sensations coming from outside. A lot of it's what comes bubbling up from within the mind. In fact, sights and sounds, etc., on their own can't destroy your meditation. It's your mind's reaction that destroys your focus. So if you learn to keep your, your response to things within bounds, and these are not confining bounds, after all, you find that you can wear them very comfortably. Someone once asked me how it was at the, the Vinaya could be seen as something liberating. That's one of the meanings of the word Bhati Moka. Something that helps with liberation. After all, it's all those rules. Well, the rules protect you. At the very least, when the community lives by a very clear set of rules, and we'd have to sit around and discuss everything for hours every week. And the behavior that's appropriate, the behavior that's not appropriate, it's all pretty clear. Everybody lives by it, nobody causes trouble for anyone else, and we all get along. When things aren't clear, when there's a lot of room for free interpretation, and there's a lot of discussions. Things have to be hashed over again and again. And it's the same with the five precepts. When certain things are out of bounds, that's it. You decide we're just not going to follow those ideas. And then you find it a lot easier to live with yourself. So these are comfortable rules. They're, they're like a fence, but it's a comfortable fence. When the mind gets more and more familiar with yourself, you find that the fence doesn't really impinge on anything that, that's really for your own good. It helps keep you on track. So it's in this way that the precepts are a way of taking the meditation into daily life and using daily life as a means for helping your meditation, because it's all a matter of developing good qualities in the mind, the qualities that can support you, that are based on honorable resolves, or resolves that you want to stick with. The right resolve is something you want to treasure. These are the areas in which desire is really a good thing, and you want to maintain those good desires. Most of us live by throwaway desires. We try something and it makes us a little bit happy, but not all that much. So you throw it away and you don't really notice what you've done. The mind doesn't make connections between its desires and the results of acting on those desires. Psychologists have shown that a lot of people don't learn from their desires. They desire something and gives them a little bit of happiness when they get it, but not all that much. And when the desire comes back up again, they think, well, maybe it'll make me happy this time. Like the old story of the person eating a bushel full of peppers, hoping to find one sweet one in there someplace. The reason for this is our desires are not all that satisfying. And yet we don't know anything else, and so we don't really pay much attention. But the Buddha said, when you take your desire for ser happiness really seriously, 
and stick to the kind of desires that really can lead to happiness. You begin to realize how valuable they are. You begin to treasure them. You learn from them. When your thoughts, words, and deeds follow through with them, you find that that quest for happiness, the desire for happiness, is something worthy of respect as well.